And we have our problem session 5 on frequency response of small signal amplifiers. I shall work out only one problem today, just one problem, but it is a loaded problem. The problem has a problem, okay. We will see what this problem is. Take down with me. There is a minus VCC, minus VCC. What does it mean? What kind of a trans? PNP, all right. That is smart. A resistance of 2.4 K. We have a transistor as guessed. It is a PNP. There is a small resistance here, 0.1 K, which as you shall see creates the problem. <coughs> and this is unbypassed. This is unbypassed. The output is taken from here through a capacitor which goes to infinity. So, the output is V0 and the <coughs> biasing is done in the usual manner, but this resistance R1 parallel R2 <coughs> is much larger than R i, where R i is the input impedance looking into the transistor, <coughs> which means that R b can be ignored. Okay? These values are not also given, but this is given 0.6 k and the voltage source is here V s. The data that are given <coughs> are that this current is 2.5 milliampere. The collector current is 2.5 milliampere DC of course, 2.5 milliampere and <coughs> beta is given as 150, V sub A is given as infinity which means that R0 <coughs> is infinity, R0 effect of R0 can be ignored. Even with these simplifications, you will see what the problem is. F t is given as 100 megahertz. You remember what F t is? F t is the transition frequency. That is the frequency at which the common emitter short circuit current amplification factor reduce, reduces to unity. Okay? And C mu has been measured independently as 0.5 puff. This is all the data that is given. What is required is A V S 0 that is the mid band gain, mid band gain to be found out and the high frequency 3 dB cutoff point F H. These are the only two quantities which are to be found out. The simplifications look simple, but even then there is a problem as you shall see. <coughs> V A is the early voltage. You recall R 0 is equal to V A divided by I sub C. If V A is given as infinity, that means R 0 goes to infinity. Okay. Now, <coughs> in, in drawing the equivalent circuit, we require the value of R pi, we require the value of G M and therefore, the first thing we do to solve the problem is to find out G M. G m is 2.5 milliampere that is I sub C divided by 26 millivolt. Let us take it as 25 to keep life simple, okay? 25 millivolt and therefore, this is 0.1 or more, 0.1 more, okay? <coughs> therefore, R pi which is beta by G m is 150 <coughs> divided by 0.1 more which is equal to 1.5 K and C mu of course has been given as 0.5 puff. We also require the value of C pi that is one of the ideas <coughs> I had in mind when picking up this problem. How to calculate C pi? Now, if F t is given you know omega t 
which is equal to 2 pi multiplied by ft which is 10 to the power 8 10 to the 8 hertz this is equal to gm divided by c pi plus c mu now gm is known 0.1 mo and c mu is known 0.5 puff and therefore this relationship gives you the value of c pi <coughs> all right the value of C pi and C pi in my calculation comes out as 159 puff. It's a fairly large value and we are pretty sure that it is C pi which will dominate the high frequency 3 dB cutoff. No, we can't be sure. Why not? Because C mu will cause Miller effect and C mu 1 plus G m R L prime may be much larger than C pi. So, a large C pi does not necessarily mean that C pi will dominate. C pi at the most will contribute. Okay. Now, let us draw the <coughs> equivalent circuit. By looking at the original circuit, the equivalent circuit becomes V s 0.6 k, then R B is negligible, R B effect of R B can be ignored and therefore, we shall have R pi that it is a PNP transistor does not change the equivalent circuit. PNP transistor only means that the biasing has to be done properly. Okay. The voltage here is V pi, then <coughs> we have the C pi, this is R S. R pi is 1.5 k, C pi is 159 puff, then we have the G m V pi which is equal to 0.1 V pi <coughs> All right. and R 0 is ignored. Is there a load resistance? No. Just a bit. No, everything is the same as far as incremental equivalent circuit is concerned. It depends on the polarity of Vs. Okay, with this polarity, this is the direction. The direction AC directions are not changed. This is also one of the points that I wanted to mention. It is only the DC biasing. As far as AC is concerned, this equivalent circuit is valid for both. PNP as well as NPN. Okay. There is no load, but there is a load of 2.4 K. This is R sub C and this voltage is V0 and the complication is this 0.1 K. In addition, <coughs> there is this inevitable C mu which is equal to 0.5 puff. <laughs> and <coughs> this resistance is R sub E. Now, C 0 is not given, so we assume it to be 0. Okay. The complication is this, we cannot apply Miller simplification here, that is the problem. We cannot apply Miller simplification. Miller simplification, if R E was equal to 0, or it was bypassed, then it was perfectly all right. This would have been the input voltage, this is the output voltage. So, we can find the gain and C mu 1 plus G m R L. Here, the gain shall be controlled by R e. Not only that, what capacitance is reflected shall also be controlled by R e. And it is not only capacitance, there would be a resistance also across it, both of which shall be frequency dependent. And therefore, in this situation, we cannot apply Miller simplification. So, what are the alternatives then? <coughs> One of the alternatives is that you take this node V1 and uh, this node V2, and this is V0, this is Vs. So, you have to write two node equations. Two node equations or 3 node equation, 
okay p0 is this voltage you have to write <coughs> three node equations and solve a 3 by 3 matrix can we once again please repeat why why can we not apply the miller simplification oh miller simplification was if you recall c mu 1 minus a v okay this was the miller voltage what is a v a v is this output divided by this input now the input here is from here to ground not across r pi the output is not across gmv pi it is this and therefore the miller simplification which was derived <coughs> <coughs> on the assumption that re was bypassed is not true we cannot make that simplification you must recognize this fact if this was shorted perfectly all right we could have done that but not otherwise fortunately <coughs> This is the point that I wanted to make. Fortunately, there is an alternative technique that is available. Whenever Miller cannot be used, that technique is more general. It can be used always, although a fairly uh, rough approximation, although a fairly rough approximation. And this simplification, <coughs> I will give the logic later. All right. First, let me enunciate the principle. The principle is, <coughs> as I said, in electronic circuits as also in other fields, logic can be supplied if the method works. Some logic can be worked out. Logic may not be necessary to work out. If the method works, it works. That is it. Okay? <coughs> Suppose there is not more than 10 percent deviation, we do not care. Then we do not care. Now, the method that is available, let me tell you that this is a very simple circuit, one transistor, a couple of resistors and two capacitors have to be taken. Even here, we do not want to write the node equation, okay? because in design, uh, on paper and pencil, node equation writing and inversion of a matrix is complicated. You can use one of the subroutines, one of the algorithms that is available, a package like SPICE, this is the most commonly used <coughs> commonly used algorithm uh, for this uh, purpose for network analysis <coughs> but even there even there uh, conditions may be, uh, the numerical uh, calculation may be ill conditioned and you may not get the result that you want it has to be applied with caution and it may not be available for a simple circuit like this we don't want to use spice now as you go ahead you will see when two transistors are involved if it is a cascade or a cascode or some other combination as we shall see later, the problem becomes tougher. Then you have to write 6 to 7 node equations. If it is an integrated circuit containing some 1000 transistors, okay, then of course it is an ocean. There is nothing that you can do except to go to the computer and believe in that box blindly. All right. <coughs> The problem is very tough in integrated circuit design, where indeed there will be very large number of transistors. Even an op -amp contains as many as 19 to 20 transistors connected in a very uh, complicated manner. You know, for biasing, you require current mirrors. Every transistor will have to have a current mirror unless there is a current repeater. Um, then there will be level shifting, there will be power amplification, there will be voltage amplification, there will be buffer, all kinds of things. Okay? And if you draw the equivalent circuit and try to analyze it by Miller or by some other means, you will go absolutely crazy. And therefore, but FH and FL, that is the gain, if I plot it, it would be something like this. There would be a mid band at which the gain will be nearly constant. We want to know what this frequency is and what this frequency is FH. That determines the character of the amplifier. That determines whether the amplifier is suitable or not. For example, if it is an audio amplifier, <coughs> then you want to know if F L is of the order of 16 hertz or no or not. F H is of the order of 16 kilohertz or not. Okay? This is the range that you want to amplify and you must know what its F L and what its F H is. The problem is the reverse way. You are asked to design an amplifier for a specified F L and F H. Now, given an amplifier, so 
particularly in uh, multiple transistor circuits as in integrated circuits, this method that I am going to talk about is the only method and many textbooks do not even mention this. Okay? Burns and Bond does not mention this. So, please do follow me carefully. The method is called the method of time constants. And we shall use this to solve this circuit. <coughs> method of time constants, it can be used to determine F L as well as F H. Both F L and F H can be determined by the method of time constants and the method is this. If your problem <coughs> is to determine F H, then identify the capacitors in this circuit, identify the capacitors. In this particular case, the capacitors are C pi and C mu. Okay? <coughs> now, <coughs> assume C mu to be open, assume C mu to be open and find out the Thevenin resistance that is seen by C pi assume C mu, assume all other capacitors to be open, if there are more than two, assume all capacitors except one to be open and find out across C pi <coughs> what is the Thevenin resistance. Okay? Let this resistance be called R pi, R pi is not R b parallel small R pi, here R pi is the Thevenin resistance seen by C pi and to distinguish between that R pi and this R pi and also to indicate that all other capacitors are open, we use a superscript. This is not a power, it is not R pi to the power 0, it is R pi super O, okay? O for open circuit, not this capacitors but other capacitors. Similarly, similarly you find out, you open C pi and find out what is R mu O, that is the Thevenin resistance or the resistance seen by C mu. I am mentioning Thevenin because independent sources are eliminated. In this calculation, independent sources are eliminated. Okay? Then <coughs> after you find these two resistors, this will not be very tough. This will not be very tough because it will contain some control sources and resistors. That is all nothing else, no other capacitor and therefore, it is a purely resistive circuit and resistive circuit solution is not a bad problem okay, at all. So, what you do is you find out these two time constants tau pi O which is equal to well, we can simply say tau pi C pi R pi O and tau mu the time constant which is the product of C mu and R mu O add them, add them to find out tau which is equal to tau pi plus tau mu and call this tau h. <coughs> then, tell me. Why you put in a code tau pi? No, I do not have to. It is understood. It is understood that this time constant is calculated under open circuit condition for all other capacitors. Once you calculate the time constants for the various capacitors, there may be more than two. For example, in the ordinary common emitter circuit with short circuited emitter resistor, there are three capacitors C pi, C mu and C L, C 0. Fortunately, C 0 is not given here. We will we'll bring that complication later. Okay? You must follow this very carefully because this is the only method available for IC design. Okay? After you calculate the time constants, add them up. Add them up and call the total time constant as tau h. This capital H super, uh, sub subscript stands for high frequency. Okay? And then omega h, the high frequency 3 dB uh, point in radians per second is approximately equal to 1 over tau h. It could be? Not 2 pi. 2 pi will come if you find out f h. f h would be 
1 over 2 pi tau h. Okay? I'll come to the logic later. I'll come to the logic later. <coughs> First I want to make the calculation, then, then I'll supply the logic. Now, please listen to me. If instead of two capacitors, if it's a complicated circuit with uh, C1, C2, Cn, n number of capacitors, okay, maybe uh, three transistor circuit, you have nine capacitors, then, okay. Then what you do is found, you find out tau h which is equal to Ci Rio where I goes from 1 to n, all right, and then Fh is equal to approximately an approximation 2 pi tau h. <coughs> okay. Now, a quickly, a look at the logic. A look at the logic. Okay. Since the question has been raised, a look at the logic. <coughs> now, if we are calculating high frequency response, each capacitor contributes to a pole each capacitor contributes to a pole and therefore <coughs> due to n capacitors the high frequency <coughs> response would be of the form uh, some constant divided by 1 plus j omega by omega 1 times 1 plus j omega by omega 2 and so on all right which can be written as constant divided by, this is the logic. Logic is also rough, the approximation is rough, the logic is also not very uh, strict logic. Okay? So, I can write this as 1 plus j omega 1 over omega 1 plus 1 over omega 2 and so on plus higher order terms, higher order in omega, in omega, that is we will have omega squared, <coughs> j omega cubed and so on and so forth, all right. And if we ignore, if we ignore all these higher order terms, which we usually can do for frequency around omega <coughs> h, then obviously this can be written approximately as constant divided by 1 plus j omega by omega h and obviously omega h obviously 1 over omega h is approximately <coughs> equal to 1 by omega 1 plus 1 by omega 2 and so on. 1 by omega h by definition is tau h and therefore tau h equal to tau 1 plus tau 2 and so on. That is the logic. The logic is that you retain only the first order terms in the denominator and neglect the rest. And you, <coughs> you remember that when tau 1 was calculated, <coughs> the other capacitors were left open and therefore these are all open circuit time constants and I can use the subscript 0. Okay? These are all open circuit time constants, that is all other capacitors are left open. We shall apply it to the circuit that we have already calculated by Miller and also an exact expression and we shall, we shall see what kind of approximation it affords. <coughs> but before that, let us complete this example. The uh, <coughs> equivalent circuit, if I draw it once again, was 0.6k, yes. So what about FL? Oh, I will come to that. I will come to that. Let me finish this, then I will come to FL. Okay. We have a 1.5 K V pi, <coughs> then 159 puff, 0.1 K, then 0.1 V pi, that is GM V pi, and 2.4 K this is V0. Now, in order to calculate, oh, how could I forget that? <laughs> I will put it in red because this is the source of all problems. <coughs> C1 
SMU is 0.5 power. <coughs> now, <coughs> if I want to calculate R pi O, what I want to do is the, capa is the resistance seen by 159 puff. And therefore, what I will do is, and we will leave 0.5 picofarad open. So, let us see what the circuit becomes. Also, it is the Thevenin equivalent, therefore, V s shall be shorted. So, the equivalent circuit to determine R pi O becomes this. R pi O, this is across C pi, we have a 1.5 k, 1.5 k and this is V pi. Then we have from here a 0.6 k to ground, agreed? Because V s is shorted, even in resistance and we have from here a 0.1 k, 0.1 k. Uh, then we have from here a 0.1 V pi, 0.1 V pi and we have 2.4 k, 2.4 k, all right. <coughs> I will, uh, since 2.4 k is in series with a current source, it has no effect and therefore, I can replace the whole thing, whole thing by a current source 0.1 V pi, okay. I can ignore the whole thing, the 2.4 k drops out of consideration, all right. So, what we have to do now is to connect a voltage source, I want to calculate this resistance. This resistance cannot be calculated by combination of resistances because there is a control source, there is a dependent source. So, what I want to do is I connect a V here and I find the current I and R pi O shall be V by I, okay. Let me draw this circuit, it has become a little messy. Let me draw this circuit on a clean Slate. This is not a slate, this is a plate. 1.5 k, this current is I, and then we have 0.6 k, 0.1 k to emphasize that these are connected. I am not drawing the ground, I am connecting them <coughs> together, and then we have a current source 0.1. What is V pi? V pi is also V. So, why keep a, another uh, variable? Just put V, all right. So, I have to calculate I. Now, <coughs> these are ways of one has to improvise without writing any loop equation, node equation or simultaneous solution. One can do it by inspection. What is this current? I minus V by 1.5 K. All right, and <coughs> pardon me. Is that okay? Then what is this current? I minus V by one point five k minus point one V. This current comes here, breaks up into two parts. One is point one V, and the other is this. All right. So if I write a <coughs> a loop equation around this. Uh, let me use a different color. <coughs> I want a lighter color, okay. Around this, okay. If I write the loop equation, my equation becomes V equals to V, this voltage equals to the drop in 0.6 k. So, 0.6 k multiplied by I minus V by 1.5 k, all right, plus the drop in 0.1 k, which would be plus 0.1 k multiplied by I minus V by 1.5 k minus 0.1 V, all right. Is this point clear? This loop equation. This equation contains only V and I and therefore, you can find out the ratio V by I and my calculation shows that V by I equal to 
0.061k. <coughs> That's only 61 <coughs> ohms. That is what C pi C is. All right? Okay. Then we have to calculate R mu 0. Well, that's not what, what all that one has to do is to be careful in drawing the equivalent circuit. If I draw C mu 0, well, R mu 0, R mu 0 is across C mu and C pi is open and therefore what we have is a 1.5 k V pi remains we have a point 0.1k, point 0.1k and I will not draw the ground, I will show them connected a little later. Then we have a current generator point 0.1 V pi, now, now 2.4k can no longer be ignored, 2.4k because what you have to do is to connect a voltage source here plus minus and calculate the current I. <coughs> is my circuit complete? No. There is a 0.6k and these come together. <coughs> what I will do now is to write what we have to find out is V by I and the intermediate variable is V pi. So let us first identify the currents. What is this current? Current I comes here and the current that goes here is V pi divided by 1.5 K. V pi is no longer equal to V. Okay? So this current must be I minus V pi divided by 1.5 K. All right. <coughs> then what is this current? I plus point one V pi. Wonderful. How did you calculate this? Because this current must be I, I. and this current is point one V pi. So this current must be I plus point one V pi. All right. Therefore, we can write a loop equation like this, the big loop, the outside loop. Okay? It would be this drop plus this drop would be equal to V. And the other equation that we can write is this loop. Okay? What about this loop? Take any two independent loops. You cannot write a, uh, this loop because there is a current generator here. You must be careful about this. Okay? We do not know what the drop across this is. So I cannot write a KVL here. Okay? So the only other loop that is available to me is this for which I know this current. Okay, I know this voltage, this voltage across 0.6K. This would be the voltage across this which is V pi plus the voltage across this. Now, therefore, I have to find out the current. What is this current? Okay, 0.1 plus 1, 1 by 1.5 K times V pi. So, you know this current. No? Yes, sir. You must be careful about this K. What is the unit of this 0.1? more and therefore when you write 1.5 you don't write 1 by 1.5 that will be absolutely wrong it is 1 by 1500 moles okay that's why i'm retaining the dimension ultimately when you solve you do that so you write two loop equations from which you eliminate v pi this algebra i leave to you my calculation gives my calculation gives r mu 0 if there is a question now, ask me. You may not get another problem of this type. I mean, I may not solve another problem of this type. Yes. Why? Oh, because the first loop contains V pi, V and I. I do not want V pi. I want only the ratio V by I. So I need a second loop. 
to eliminate V pi. All right, and my value comes R mu O as 15.5 K. Therefore, the total tau tau H, which is equal to tau pi O plus tau mu O, that is equal to 0 0.061 K multiplied by 159 puff. What will be the unit of this? 10 to the minus 9, which is nanosecond. Okay, So this will be in time, it is nanosecond, plus 15.5 K multiplied by 0.5, so many nanoseconds, Ns. And therefore, FH, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi tau, is equal to 9.11 megahertz. It's a good amplifier. It goes right up to 9.11 megahertz. And as far as <coughs> the other part of the problem was to find out AVSO, the mid-band gain. Well, that should be simple. <coughs> mid-band gain, you ignore all the capacitors, draw the equivalent circuit. Well, let me do it and tell you what the value is my equivalent circuit for a VSO is Vs 0.6 k 1.5 k this is V pi 0.1 k we have already done it I suppose we must have done <coughs> it with unbypassed resistor unbypassed ok pardon me approximately so we want the exact gain Oh, that's a good uh, good uh, clue. Well, what should what is the gain that you expect? Minus two point four divided by point one, which is twenty. Okay. Now see what happens here. This is two point four k, <coughs> and this is v zero. Uh, can you solve it by inspection? Yes, uh, there is nothing much. You see, this is beta plus one uh, by r pi or one, this is point 0.1 plus 1 over 1.5 k v pi, this current, and therefore you can write a loop equation, find out v pi, and the output voltage v0 is point, <coughs> minus point 0.1 v pi multiplied by 2.4 k. So you can find out. This is almost by inspection. The value comes as minus 20.9. The approximate value was 24. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. So this calculation, I leave it to you. <coughs> now, the other part of the calculation, well, let me illustrate this principle so that it sticks to your mind by considering the common emitter amplifier with bypassed RE. Let us see what happens there. If we apply the same principle. With bypassed RE, the ordinary CE amplifier at high frequencies, you have Vs, Rs, then you have R pi, which is the parallel combination of Rb and R pi. This is V pi, and then you have C pi, C mu, no Miller. I'm trying to calculate by uh, the method of open circuit time constant. Now I shall put an adjective, open circuit, because in the low frequency case it will be the short circuit time constant. Now let's see. C mu, you have gm v pi. Now there is no problem in, in incorporating R0 and therefore we say RL prime, which is the parallel combination of small r0 capital R sub capital C and capital R sub capital L. And then of course you have the <coughs> output capacitance C0. This is V0. Okay. Now to calculate <coughs> a couple of things you can calculate directly. You can see directly what these are. For example, what is um, ROO? That is what is the resistance seen by CO? Simply RL prime. 
Agreed? Because there is a current generator and this voltage is zero if Vs is zero. Okay. However, the other two are not obvious. To calculate R pi, let's no. To calculate, we also know what is what C, P, C pi C is. What does C pi C? That's right. R pi parallel R S. Um, <coughs> That's right. It's only C mu that gives us a problem. Let us see what this problem is. From C mu, you calculate, you find out a V and find the current I. This is the terminals of C mu. C pi is open, so you have R pi. What is this resistance? R pi parallel? R S. And on the other side, this is V pi. On the other side, you have Gm V pi in parallel with Rl prime. So that's not too bad. You can see that V pi, V pi is simply I times, I times, what is this resistance? R pi, <coughs> right? So V pi is I times R pi O, and this is Gm V pi, this is Rl prime. So it's not difficult to find out what the current is. You have to write <coughs> one equation, that's all. <coughs> okay. Let me leave this calculation to you. You can show that R mu O equals to R R pi O <coughs> plus R L prime one plus G M R pi O. I hope I am right. R pi O plus R L prime or I can write it the other way around. I can also write this as R L prime plus R pi O 1 plus G M R L prime. This is simple circuit analysis so I will skip this. After you find out the three resistances then your tau H <coughs> pardon me well, let's go directly to omega h. Omega h becomes r pi parallel r s times, if you add them up, see I wanted to write it in this form, why? Because I have this g m r l prime here. So, I will multiply this by c mu okay? and you can see that c mu 1 plus g m r l prime that C m, the Miller capacitance comes. Okay, that's why I wanted to write it in this form. All right. If R L prime is the parallel combination of small R zero, R C, and R L. Yeah, we are not doing the question. We have gone to the ordinary common emitter amplifier with bypassed R L. I wanted to show that the method of time constants, open circuit time constants, works here also. Okay, so if you add them up and take the reciprocal, this is the result that you get: C T plus C zero plus C mu R L prime. If you recall the exact analysis that we had done for the same circuit, our uh, <coughs> expression was from exact analysis, node analysis. Our expression was minus G M. R L prime, let me recall, R pi divided by R pi plus R S times 1 minus G omega divided by G M over C mu divided by, you recall this that we had put this equal to omega 3 and we said omega 3 is very large and therefore we shall ignore this term. So this calculates, this uh, qualifies as the A V S 0 and in the denominator we had 1 plus j omega multiplied by r pi parallel r s c t plus exactly this expression c 0 plus c mu r l prime then minus omega squared and omega squared term r l prime etc etc. And we had said that usually this term can be ignored and therefore omega h is the reciprocal of this quantity. Don't you see 
that the method of open circuit time constants gives exactly the same result. It is not Miller. What does Miller give? What does Miller approximation give? Miller gives only this part. Miller gives R pi parallel R s multiplied by C t. All right. So, the three approaches are quite similar and it, it brings in confidence that the method of open circuit time constant perhaps is a bit better than Miller approximation. However, if Miller approximation can be applied, we do not go to method of time constant because that is a, that is a bit time consuming. <laughs> method of open circuit time constant is a bit time consuming. You have to calculate r pi 0, r mu 0, uh, r l 0, okay. Then add them up and then take the reciprocals. If Miller is available, nothing else is required, okay. And you see the results are not far from the exact uh, values. Now about the low frequency response, okay. In the low frequency response, let me first, let me first give the logic. All right. In the low frequency response, the response would be of the form constant divided by 1, yes if you remember, J minus J, yeah. omega by omega 1 or omega 1 by omega? Okay, omega 1 by omega. So that at DC it is equal to, the value is equal to 0. Then we have 1 minus J omega 2 by omega. And in addition, we had a factor of due to CE, we had 1 plus J omega by omega 3 and 1 plus J omega by omega 4. First, <coughs> let us look at this term. Let us look at this, this term due to CE. Now, you know which one is greater, omega 3 or omega 4? Omega 3 is much greater than omega 4, well, about 50 times, okay. So, I can write this 1 plus j omega by omega 4 divided by 1 plus j. These are some tricks of the trade, usually not mentioned in books, okay. It is only a CDR who will tell you that. <coughs> Do remember. I can write this as, let us multiply both numerator and denominator by omega 3 by j omega. Let us do that. If I do that, then in the denominator, what do I get? I multiply by omega 3 by j omega. So, I get 1 minus j omega 3 by omega, all right. And if I multiply the numerator by omega 3 by j omega, then I get omega 3 by j omega plus, what do I get? <coughs> omega 3 by omega 4. Agreed? Is the point clear? No? What is the problem? I have multiplied this, I have multiplied this. Both numerator and denominator. Okay? Now, notice the trick. Notice that around omega 3, around omega 3, this term magnitude is approximately unity, whereas this is approximately 50 and therefore, I can write this as approximately a constant. It is these frequencies which are of concern, a constant divided by 1 minus j omega 3 by omega. Why is the larger frequency of concern? Because we are calculating the low frequency response, the largest <coughs> frequency determines the low frequency response. So, so even if CE gives a kind of a low pass combination with high pass and as I had mentioned the characteristic is like this, we can approximate it by a high pass characteristic like this goes to 0. This is what we have done here. Agree? So, my low frequency transfer function would be of this form 1 minus j omega 2 by omega, 1 minus j omega 3 by omega approximately. 
and I can write this as constant divided by 1 minus j by omega, omega 1 plus omega 2 plus omega 3 plus higher order terms, which diminish as omega increases, all right. And at, if we want to calculate F L, F L, which will be dominated by this term, obviously if we ignore this, I can write this as constant divided by 1 minus J omega L by omega. And omega L therefore is simply the sum of the three poles, sum of the three poles. That is omega L is equal to summation omega i, i equal to 1 to 3. In terms of time constants, 1 over tau L is equal to summation i equal to 1 to 3, 1 over tau i. In the previous case, in the high frequency case, the time constants are added. Now, the reciprocals of the time constants are added. Okay, the reciprocals of the time constant and F L is simply equal to 1 over twice <coughs> pi tau. All right. Now, under what conditions will these time constants be calculated? Obviously, short circuit. And therefore, these time constants are written with a superscript of infinity. Short circuit means the capacitors are infinite or capacitors are shorted. In the previous case, capacitors are open. This is also the only method that is available for a very complicated circuit, engineering method, engineer's approximation. These resistances, as I said, can be calculated almost by inspection and therefore, this gives a quick calculation and this method is known as the method of short circuit time constants. We shall apply both of these methods when we come to complicated circuits that is cascade, cascode and, and Darlington connection and CBCC, CBCE all kinds of connections when you consider wide banding techniques and that is the point to, to, to stop today.